My name is Courtney Laskowski. I am a woman of faith. I'm a wife married to my high school sweetheart going on 18 years. I'm a mother of two teenage boys and I am a 911 dispatcher, which is, in my opinion, the best job in the world. It's true, there is a bit of a negative stigma that tends to come with this job. The high stress, taking calls filled with crisis, tragedy, and incredible sadness. Talking to suicidal callers, some of whom take their own lives while we're still on the line. Or family members who have just bared witness to the act itself, or have come upon the gruesome scene of their own spouse, parent, or child. The frustrations of some members of the public who choose to abuse 911 with calls that are clearly non-emergencies, like complaining about restaurant service or inconsiderate drivers. The frustrations of a toddler who's playing with their parents' phone and calling 911 non-stop during an already busy time of day when true emergencies are coming in. Walking desperate and hysterical callers through life-saving medical instructions to perform on their loved ones while we're getting paramedics on the way. Multitasking at the highest levels Talking to frantic callers on the phone and officers on a radio channel while documenting both sides of a dangerous situation, ascertaining valuable scene safety information, providing instructions to keep the caller and bystanders safe, providing medical care instructions for victims at the scene, running background checks on potentially dangerous suspects, and relaying pertinent information all at the same time. It has been said that no one calls 911 on a good day. And in the last four years I've been doing this job, I have certainly found this to be true. I've spoken to countless people in what is probably the darkest moments of their lives, but I've also been a light in their darkness, talking them through tragedy and finding hope in the life of a stranger when they believed all was lost. Sharing my name and a piece of my heart with them, letting them know they are not alone and reassuring them that I would stay with them on the line until their officer, paramedic, or firefighter could take over. I have talked to so many desperate and hurting people going through their own hell and wanting the pain of their own life to end, and with only my voice, convinced them to step back on the curb, away from the ledge, to put the gun away, leave the pills in the bottle, and ultimately make a different choice. I stay with them, on the line, until additional help can take over. I have talked to the mother of a drug user who believed wholeheartedly her son had overdosed for the last time, convinced her to pull him onto the floor and pump the chest of her boy and bring him back to life. I have been the voice of reason, put on speaker during a drunken and drug-induced domestic violence attack while he was trying to break through a barrier and into the room of my caller who had already sustained broken bones. With respect and strength in my tone, I convinced him to step away and wait in the other room so his officers could help sort this out. At the end of the call, officers reported that had I not done that, they were sure the victim would be in far worse shape or possibly would not have survived. I am a lifesaver. And then there are calls in which lives cannot be saved. Receiving the call from a desperate girlfriend who'd likely fallen asleep on an empty dark highway. The car had rolled. She had been wearing her seatbelt, but not him. It took her a while to find him, but when she did, I assisted her in giving her boyfriend chest compressions while my fellow responders came to her lights and sirens. He was pronounced dead on arrival. Taking the call from a hysterical woman who just witnessed a murder, a man, a father, a husband, shot point blank in the chest over road rage. Ascertaining information and giving instructions to clear a house and get family members away from the gruesome scene they described to me as pieces of their father and husband all over the hall, who'd just taken his own life with a shotgun. I started seeing a therapist two years ago, not because I believed I was broken, but because I'd noticed the extent of which I'd changed with this career, even in just the first two years. On the first session, she asked me what I hoped to achieve from therapy, and the best I could come up with was a cushion something that would provide space between the harsh realities of my job and my home life. See, I feel like the realities of this job that we love so much can sometimes act as an arthritis, chipping away and wearing down the cushion, the cartilage that we once felt in our lives and probably took for granted, and creating this bone-on-bone -bone feeling that's hard to put into words. See. I noticed over the course of just two years that 
I had changed and not really change in a way that I was proud of. I had lost tolerance at home. Uh, stupid little things that my kids would do would send me into fits of anger and unreasonable rage that I would take out on them. Avoiding going to church and cutting off communication and my relationship with God. I started to isolate. I would want my whole family just to stay at home where I knew that they would be safe. Uh, the feeling of paranoia that no one was good and everyone was hiding something and somehow out to get me or my family. There wasn't really one call in particular that I went to therapy for. There was one, however, that I would say was the tipping point or a pivotal point. It was a tough call. My caller had walked in and found his friend, a drowning victim. I clicked through my protocols as I asked him questions and he was clearly traumatized on the other end of the line. Because of the way the call started, I, I made a judgment that the victim was already passed away. I was anticipating going with that protocol. However, I clicked a little faster than normal and the answer he gave me wasn't exactly convincing that she was in fact dead. So I was struggling to click back into CPR instructions to give this poor kid chest compression instructions for his friend while he sobbed the entire time and begged his friend to come back to life. It felt like an eternity for my fellow first responders to arrive on scene, but then they were there. The call only lasted maybe four or five minutes in total. It felt like the longest call of my career at that point. My expectation when they arrived on scene was immediately to call a DOA, a dead on arrival, but they didn't. Instead, I heard from across the room, they're transporting your patient and they're continuing CPR. I stayed on the side channel with the officers who were there at the scene. I got CSI units en route to them, helped them to identify the victim. And about an hour in, I finally sent a message over the computer to one of the last officers who were on the call. Did she make it? His response was like a punch in my stomach. No, they called it at the hospital. At that moment, I feel like I stopped breathing. My brain was just starting to go down this dark spiral of what have I done? Did I, did I make the right call? Did I hesitate to do CPR a second too long? Even though I knew that he was about to get off shift, I asked him anyway, could you come in and tell me what happened? See, as dispatchers, we oftentimes don't hear the end of the story. We get the beginning of it, but not always the end. This one I needed closure on. Like I said, he was near the end of his shift and he said he really couldn't come in, but tomorrow someone would come in and talk to me and tell me what happened. So I continued my shift. As dispatchers do, I took the next call, the next non-emergency call, the next 911 call, the next radio channel, and my shift ended. The call had cleared the screen hours prior, but it still sat there in my head and in the pit of my stomach. I went home and went to bed, and the next day at home sucked. I was frustrated with my kids, had no tolerance for them, yelled and screamed. My dogs were even pissing me off. My husband was not on the same page. And then 10 minutes before I had to go, get ready for work and leave, I started it. A fight. A nitpicky, nonsensical argument. To this day, I can't tell you what it was about, but I know for a fact he could not have won and I probably couldn't have either. And I pushed it until the last second until I was going to be late for work. And I stormed toward the front door, frustrated and angry, and I looked down and realized my hands were shaking. And it dawned on me that I had nothing to do with my kids, nothing to do with the dogs. I wasn't mad at my husband. I just didn't want to go to work. And with tears running down my face, I went back into the living room and confessed what had been going on in my head that I was trying to ignore and push down all day. I didn't want to go into work. 
and find out that I was responsible for someone's death. But I went in. Near the end of my shift, a good friend of my family came in who was, happened to be a lieutenant. I asked him about the call the night before. And he said, oh, it was an obvious DOA, but because the victim was so young and because chest compressions had already started and the caller was so traumatized, we didn't want to call it at the house, so they transported and continued chest compressions and called it at the hospital. At that, I probably exhaled, I feel like, for the first time in 24 hours. I laughed at myself a little bit and confessed to my friend what I had done at home and the fight that I had to try to avoid coming in. And he looked at me square in the face and said, it's time. I'm sending you contact information for a counselor. I've sent my guys to her quite a few times over the years. Tell me when you've made an appointment. And so I called. It took me two months, but I called. And I told my friend, and I told my husband, and I told my kids, I told a couple of coworkers, told my parents. I was setting myself up to not chicken out like a shy kid on the playground. Because yes, my job has a negative stigma, but for me, even though I'm a huge advocate and proponent for mental health and wellness, therapy also had a stigma in my brain. How was I gonna go into an office of a stranger, lay down on their couch in a room that smelled like my friend's grandma's house, you know, with like the corner shelf full of plants, <laughs> and explain this, explain my job, and try to tell them what was wrong or what I thought was wrong with me. While they took notes with their little spectacles and in their tweed suit and said, mm-hmm, very interesting. And then they took all your money and then asked if you feel better now. That was the idea that I had in my head. The other fear that I had was that I was gonna get to the end of this therapy session and the therapist was gonna tell me that she really didn't think I was cut out for this job. After just two years, I'm this screwed up. I should probably find a different line of work. All these thoughts were going on in my head and I really did not want to end up going to this counseling session, but I went and it was nothing like that. There was a couch in the room, but I didn't lay on it. I sat in a chair and that was totally fine. <laughs> Over the course of an hour of me just kind of dumping and blabbing about my job and who I was and my history, she told me that nothing I divulged raised any red flags, but she believed that I was struggling with some post-traumatic stress and believed that trauma therapy would do me some good. So the following week we started EMDR therapy and I started to feel better. I gained a cushion back in my life. My brain was more organized. I could have clearer thoughts again than I had in a very long time. I felt freedom, and I didn't even know that I had been captive. Since then, I actually shopped around and found a different therapist that suited me even better. I, I wish, I wish that I had started so much sooner before I started cramming calls down into the depths of my mind and just moving on to the next call and the next call and the next radio channel because that's just what dispatchers do. But that's bogus because I'm Courtney Laskowski. I'm a woman of faith. I'm a wife married to my high school sweetheart for 18 years. I'm a mom of two teenage boys and I'm a 911 dispatcher. I save lives for a living. If you're a first responder watching this, you save lives for a living. Your job is so important, but you are so much more than this job. Take care of yourself, please. If you know a first responder and love a first responder and notice that something's off with them, love them enough to tell them that you notice. Love them enough to have what may be an awkward conversation. Tell them to get help. There's so many resources out there. If you're considering therapy or counseling, that's fantastic. You do not have to just go with the number one recommendation. 
If your therapist is not the right fit for you, shop around. That's totally okay. Thank you for listening. Be well.